Well, welcome to the um, to our event, exposing the roots of mass incarceration, getting at the um, cradle to prison pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, and other dynamics. I'm we're so happy you're here, and please let us know if there are any technical issues. I won't be solving the technical issues, but somebody who has technical ability will be. The, um, we'll begin with some somatic grounding. It's a nice slide from Beethoven to somatic grounding. And then uh, uh, a bit of, not, is it a poem? Yes, a poem. And then we'll begin the uh, presentations. Leo. All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to see so many familiar faces and names. Life exists outside of this event. Right? And we're getting ready to explore some very heavy topics. So if you're able and if you're willing, if you're sitting, sit up straight, let your feet come to rest flat on the floor, let your hands rest on top of your legs, your knees, in whatever way is most comfortable. And if you feel comfortable doing so, close your eyes. If not, just let them come to rest a little bit before you. And I'd like to share with you a quote. A quote that gives me hope and provides clarity. By Lilla Watson, an Aboriginal elder. She says, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us walk together. See how that's settling in your body and in your mind. Is it heavy? in your chest, in the pit of your stomach? Or does it stir up a little excitement, a bit of a challenge? If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us walk together. Take a nice deep breath in. And out. So we can settle into this space together. In. And out. as you find your centeredness and you're ready, open your eyes and let's begin this walk together. Thank you, Leo. The outline of our afternoon will be four presentations, one by Sarah Atif, the second by Bernice Hurd, the third by Maron Dirsch, and the last by Leo Hilton. We will then have some questions 
and answers from the group. And after that, we'll go into breakout rooms with a dialogue facilitator and talk about the aspects of the conversations and what you've heard and, and work that through as a, as a group. And then each group will come back and do a short debrief of what they held on to and what they uh, found either difficult or challenging or wonderful. So we will begin with Sarah Ati and the presenters will just go in that order. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for coming here with us and sharing the space where we, we are going to talk about a very important issue that Patricia just mentioned, a school to prison pipeline. I will share my screen for the presentation. And this presentation is, uh, you know, this presentation is going to uncover what we're going, what, all, what we're going to talk about uh, in the session in general. And, uh, you know, any, any questions that you have, you can just, uh, uh, just, you know, keep them with you and then we can, you know, address the questions in the end. So if, you know, we, we, the way we, we're starting, it should not look very abrupt. We have been doing that for quite some time at the lab, talking about these issues. So let me take you back to a, to a time where we talk about, you know, why do we go to school or why do we send our kids to school? And, you know, what does conflict mean in a school setting? And is, is school a conducive environment where mistakes are seen as learning moments? And, and, you know, do we see that in schools, verbal and nonverbal force is used to correct behavior or not? And in the end, we are trying to look at the fact that as, as a school system or as learning environments, are we healing or are we causing more trauma? Do we, do we see kids saying in the morning they're happily going to school or there are things that they're uncomfortable with? We as community need to look into all that to see that you know it's a place where we are not funneling the school to prison pipeline and creating an environment where every person gets to do what they want to do in life and not be stuck somewhere where where you know they cannot be as where, where it's not uh, as easy for them to do things like like the rest so so I would share a case study with you initially uh, to start with. It's a, it's a very interesting case study. I'll give you three cases we can just quickly discuss and see. So, and, and I, you know, most of my examples would be in the elementary school setting. I understand that a lot of people don't see the, the link of elementary school and all that we talk about, but we can see linkage with these three examples. So first example uh, was of a kid uh, in, in, let's say, in, in kindergarten, from kindergarten to third grade he was told how he was misbehaving and how things were not right and how he and then you know uh, till third grade there was a time that every day he would be sent to the principal's office or he would be he had to sit on a separate desk or there was would be a situation where he and the rest of the community was told that there's something wrong with his behavior that's the first case study the second case study is of another kid who was in second grade uh, in second grade uh, so there's this, imagine a mom's group sitting and talking about the same kid not being nice to their child and saying things about yes, you know how we try to fix you know as as humans how we think everything is right with us and we trying to fix the environment and saying what's wrong with that child and how he or she is not behaving properly and in the end what happens is that at the cafeteria they have a separate table assigned to him. Now the community itself talking to the other kids, they are not comfortable with the idea of one person being sitting separately because of the way they behave. Third example is of a kid in fifth grade. Now this kid is a very happy kid with his uh, home environment. He, he tends to be more open and uh, which we, we, we should not say mischievous, but more doing what he wants to do. And what he ends up getting is emails sent to parents saying that that's wrong with him. And then in the end, nobody wants to be his friends. By fifth grade, they, they are told or the system make them learn that you should, you know, choose your friends based on what they, what they do and how do they behave. In all these three, three situations, what we see is. Sarah, you're muted. Sarah, you're muted. You just muted right now. 
sorry about that. Uh, as a community, we just see how we uh, look at different patterns and set perspectives in a certain way and make kids think in a certain way. As a community now see the kids sitting on the table is one person. The community is a you know group are then different uh, stakeholders in this environment. And it doesn't stop here. This keeps going on. It's not just a social behavior. Uh, where you know we say a thing happened and then you know there's no consequence of that that behavior so if we if you look at school settings uh you know and we say let's say conflict in school environment what do we see do we see shaming do we see labeling do we see pointing fingers do we see stressed I, like i i'll take the liberty to say that but do we see st st stressed adults not well equipped to handle conflict Outraged kids uh, oblivious to the harm caused by them, stressful schools, school environment, or we or do we see space to talk? Do we say see impact of misbehaviors? Do we see the ability to show each other the trauma caused by a certain behavior? Are we solving problems? Do we see community? And do we often <clears throat> hear from kids that they're not being heard? They're not being heard. And when you look at school to prison pipeline, uh, it is where children are funneled out of public schools and into a juvenile and criminal justice system. Now, it's, it, there's definitely a connection. These simplistic things have a connection to what happens later on. And when we talk about zero tolerance policies and criminalization of minor uh, you know, uh, issues, we, we, we see the failure of handling or the ability of schools to handle those issues in a way that the vulnerable populations are not in a, in a situation where conflict is uh, escalated to the level where prisons are filled with so many uh, uh, with, are filled with so many students. If you look at this graphic, <clears throat> you can find it on the internet also. It tells you uh, what goes on and how intersectionality pay, uh, plays a part in uh, how how the prisons are filled. And if you see, thirty one percent of black students represent uh, 30 uh, of school related arrests and they and uh, you know and if you look at this uh, if you look at this quotation uh, it's very interesting to see that in every one of us there's a deep desire to connect to others in a good way or, or a good way to each other so if you go back to our, our three case studies you know we can make a connection of how everybody wants to be a part of uh, what goes on and if you look at, uh, you know, we talk about circles, like the idea I'm presenting here is that we should have uh, circles at, at school level also, and focus on building relationships and community based approaches where, uh, you know, um, things are done in a way that we, we work on healing and we do not just uh, point fingers. And if you look at circles to create supportive environment, we can see that the simplicity of circle process is something that would enable uh, that would enable uh, in, enable us to work in a way that uh, you know they we, we understand the importance of coexisting with each other and eventually uh, through a process we learn about our, uh, behavior of our impact uh, in general on the environment we are in and you know uh, we we say that circles uh, can bring in bring in an organizational change and that's not just uh, that's not just true for uh, uh, for uh, no, you know, for an, uh, for an official organization setting, but even a school environment, uh, you know, it can definitely change, uh, transform the culture. And <clears throat> since we say circles is is a volunt is it is a thing that you do by choice, so that can enable environments to have respect and trust, and uh, it can uh, focus a lot on relationship building. And you know, one one thing that we that I really like about circles is the value framework. And it's not about just circles; it's the values we carry as people. And you know, if if those values let let's let's say a school system or, or, or one school comes up with a certain value that comes from those kids that they want to live by, and those values can become the school culture eventually. So you know, let if if you look at some values that we you know, let's say if I <clears throat> if I ask a few of you, what values do you have? So, you know, all those values, imagine if they become a part of a school culture, what impact would it have um, on schools? And you know, when you talk about circles, it, it might sound very simplistic, but circles can be for students. We can have circles for teachers. Yes, staff sometimes need circles for team building, for, in, for being in a situation where 
<clears throat> they can see how to handle conflict betterly uh, in a better way than you know circles for cafeteria team bus drivers custodians circles for everyone and you know what could be some circle settings uh, classroom setting could be a good setting for circle library staff room playground and you know more, we can definitely add more things based on how things are and when we talk about uh, uh, you know circles, generally we attach the idea of change with it. Yes, obviously, if we try to have something like that in the system, we do want it to change. Yes, there is change there, but the change is gradual. And one thing which which I think is very important is to have clarity on the fact that what are we expecting out of this? What is the expected output? And then in the end. A very important thing to know is that circle process is followed completely and generally when you talk to someone in school settings or, or talk to an administrator in school settings and ask them about circle or recommend them, they would the first thing they would say we have circle time so distinguishing that we're talking about circle circle practice as the thing that would bring about a change in the environment. <clears throat> and you know. Um, it is interesting how uh, uh, how if we have uh, if we do it in a way that circle like i said earlier circle practice is followed in totality it would be very conducive and you know we could see the healing power of those circles because the idea behind uh, anything like that is that <clears throat> we, we learn from each other and the environment itself becomes conducive and then uh, you know we see less problems and we see more solutions and you know human experience has mental physical emotional and spiritual aspect uh, the concept of having peace inside is beautiful. It keeps a person intact, happy, and grounded. This gives the ability to work with a free mind. All the above is true, not just for us, but also for children. For a school-age person, school is a big part of their life, and it tends to be a safe and happy place and not a, not a road to prison. Circles can create space for understanding and coexisting without causing harm. Uh, thank you all very much for listening, uh, and I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, in the breakout rooms. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was lovely. Uh, Vernice. Hi, everyone. My name is Vernice. Um, I want to share my screen. Is that how we're doing this? Okay. <laughs> so give me one second. So um, my presentation, sorry. So sorry, y'all. I don't know what is going on. Okay, so my presentation will be about the political ecologies and the liminal space of positive youth development and its relationship to the cradles prison pipeline. So, a political political ecology, according to Alan France, is basically the theory that um, there are a lot of the way that people interact with their system with the system that we live in has a lot to do with the identities that form over time. So this has a lot to do with you know, youth development in terms of gang violence, in terms of just collectives as a whole, religion, and just how they self-identify within the community. So there are many theories of youth development, such as functionalism, Marxism, authoritarian populism, but all of these have to do with the fact that criminalized youth are often referred to as delinquent, behaviorally deficient, disabled, or at risk. However, youth all serve a purpose within the community. The negative subjectification of youth is in close relation to structural powers of these social institutions. So again, within um, a political ecology, there is the microsystem, the exosystem, and the macrosystem. If you have this graphic um, in the microsystem, that is basically the school setting with your peers, um, your religious setting and family, anything that is familiar to you as an individual. And it has a lot to do with your um, identity directly. The exosystem is more the community um, in here is includes the mass media, health entities, and school. Um, the macro system are on basically kind of like the systemic and structural scale where it's society, your nationality, the culture and political system existing. So with all of that information, I would like to talk about youth incarceration in a liminal space. Um, so 
at the bottom corner here, you see in this little gray box that a liminal space is a space that a person is in during a transitional period, whether it's emotional or physical. So um, in terms of duration, there, although there is still an over-reliance on detention, studies show that youth incarceration has decreased 70% uh, as, as of 2019 since 1995. As of 2020, according to the Office of Juvenile Delinquency Prevention, the U.S. has made an estimated 400,000, 400,300 arrests of uh, youth under eight, the age of 18. And usually what kind of like feeds into the reasons for the arrest for the quote unquote delinquency is social changes caused by moving populations, changing economic conditions and the social climate that have an impact on delinquency. According, and again, this is according to the Office of Juvenile Delinquency Prevention. So basically what that is saying is that it, for me, it translated into like, be, just because a lot of um, people under the age of 18 are being arrested for, you know, a lot of different types of crimes that doesn't necessarily mean that their conditions are a result of their fault completely. It can also be a cause of just their environmental conditions and basically the life that they live outside of what we know or see. Um, and uh, that has to do with, you know, their social life, their economic conditions, and basically the social climate that they are always in. And a lot of times those can be very small interactions or small occurrences, but they do have a big impact on our behavior as human beings. My next point is within the population of a red, it's important to understand the liminal space and analyzing the criminalized use. So a lot of these arrests can have, be a case of you know, racial profiling, um, um, basically feeling like somebody has something to do with something or conspired about it, um, who that person is associated with. And basically sometimes on an interpersonal scale, it can be just a labeling of past offenses as the officer may know the, like somebody on the street and just wanna like mess. This enables the cradle to prison pipeline by focusing on the delinquencies in youth. And that enables internalization in the formation of an individual or collective identity. So basically it's like the way internalization works, it's an entire like thing of psychology. It's basically where if somebody keeps something about yourself, whether it is true or not, somehow, some way you will stop believe it and you will react to it so basically um how this enables the cradle to prison pipeline is if somebody is reacting to the notion that they a uh, delinquent you know they can have social outbursts and then and the society like society around them might criminalize them or label somebody who has behavioral issues and then with that also it kind of enables a sense that they don't really have a lot of resources because people are looking at them as if they do not want to help them because they are a Jew. Although there I am aware that there are many resources out there it is important to point out that a lot of these resources are so very expensive and um kind of like not as accessible as they need to be. Um, but anyway, how these forces interact with the youth are effective and what choices they believe that they have to make in order to basically survive with respect and some sort of dignity within the society, especially in a society that feels like they don't deserve any, since that society keeps focusing on their behavioral issues and the label of delinquency. So this um, kind of, leads into like what positive youth development is, especially in a liminal space. So positive youth development focuses on the interests of youth and uses youth population as a resource for the community. Um, this basically means that they, that you are to like amplify youth decision and voice. Um, the liminal space exists in the trust and the moral side 
self-identification in you. What I mean by that is that, you know, in order to work with somebody, they have to trust you. And, you know, when you are labeled as a criminal or if you are just criminalized in general, it can be hard to trust other people that they are going to believe you. And there are also things that you have probably done in your life that felt like you needed to do it well, felt like that were necessary to you, but it might not feel necessary to somebody else. And that is what I mean by like moral self-identification. So um, next there is like, there must be a focus on the interest and existing skills and experience of the youth. So basically as you enable trust, um, this, you have to enable the trust in the self and confidence when interacting with other sectors of society. So. I mean that kind of like in the youth sense, when you focus on the interest rather than the delinquency or rather than all of the negative things that are associated with the youth and focus on the interest and the skills that they have that probably went into something that they did, trust, that enables them to basically trust their surrounding environment, have more confidence in what they're doing. So I think about it like, say, if somebody is very good at like stealing i know growing up i knew a lot of people who stole from like the store that's probably but i knew a lot of people who like were able to go into a store and so much but like very inconspicuous and then those same people were able to read the environment that they were in so if we were in somewhere with like another convenience store, they were able to scope out like who else in that convenience store was stealing and was not, whether they knew them or not. And then there's uh, also the other things where I also grew up in an environment where there was a lot of drug trafficking. It takes a lot of tactics. So there are people I know now who were involved in trafficking, but are now like enlisted into the Navy for like secret operations and things like that. So I feel like that, that is a for me, example of like focusing on the positive and it's like even though people that I know committed crime and were able to get away with it somehow the system that they worked in or work other systems that they worked with saw the skills that they had within that and instead of focusing on that they kind of like were like okay well why don't you take this skill away from doing that and then like come help us out into doing something that we feel like can benefit society okay sorry so um, I found this, and this is according to the I Can Find Foundation. So they have the five, the six C, yeah, the six C's of positive youth development, and that is the competence, the connection, confidence, character, caring, and the contributions. And that basically all has to go into the environment of enabling positive youth development. And. Yep, that is the end of my presentation. Sorry, I'm trying to connect. So with that, I will pass to... Um, Maroon. Yeah, Maroon, sorry. The, this You're good. Thing, like, popped up on my screen. Okay, bye. You're good. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here and good job, Bernice and Sarah, on your presentation. Let me share my screen. Ooh. It's on the wrong page. Give me one second. Okay, let me share my screen. Share. Can everyone see this? Uh, view slideshow. Can you all see? Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, hi. So I'm doing my presentation on the misunderstanding of the school to prison pipeline, misunderstanding the school to prison pipeline. This was an article by Simone Walker on Arlington Now. I can drop the link uh, in the chat later on. So in this article, uh, she talks about the three main components of um, uh, misunderstanding the school to prison pipeline, specifically as it relates to um, Arlington. So illiteracy is the first one she discusses. Children who struggle to read in the first grade are 88% more likely to struggle in grade four. This kind of goes back to uh, the case study that Sarah was talking about. Um, you, you might not think that what happens in elementary school influences what happens later on in life, but it plays a big role. So if they can't read 
if they're struggling to read in grade four, uh, they're gonna struggle to read in middle school and high school and then end up dropping out of school. And then 85% of juveniles who interact with the code system are functionally illiterate. Um, that's a really important number, 85%. And then 60% of the nation's inmates are illiterate. Um, next is special education. This was really important to me, especially because um, I have a sister that has Down syndrome. And um, I personally saw how she was treated by the, the school system because of her disability. Um, in, in the article, she talks about how uh, students that are in special education or have disabilities often receive inferior services and are often segregated from their fellow classmates, um, such as uh, they have different lunch tables, um, they have different classrooms, and there aren't as many opportunities to engage with their, um, with their uh, fellow classmates. So according to the Arlington Public School 2019 Special Education Evaluation, um, they found that more than one third of the students with individualized education plans um, have reported that their teachers do not have high expectations for them and they don't feel understood or supported by these teachers. And one third reported not being able to participate in after school activities not being treated fairly and not feeling welcome within their school. Um, this could be really detrimental to um, any student. And then when this is met with punishment, it causes even more issues. Uh, for example, I knew some students in my um, younger years who had um, disabilities and because not everybody understood why they reacted to their environment the way they did. They were often shunned not only by students, but by teachers as well. Um, that takes me to the third reason, uh, the third uh, aspect that um, was spoken about in the article, which is uh, desperate discipline and uh, disproportionate referrals to law enforcement. So when people, don't understand um, when people don't understand why students with uh, disabilities, physical or mental, uh, react to their environments the way they do. It can lead to them uh, being punished for for things that they can't necessarily control, and that leads to a cycle of um, them, you know, maybe committing uh, crimes or, or things of that matter. And, you know, it ends it, them in juvie and then in jail and things like that. So um, like Sarah mentioned before, um, it was found that the black students are suspended, expelled and reported to law enforcement three times more than white students. Um, and when they are being referred to law, law enforcement, there is never um, a taught to their disabilities or the trauma they might have in their personal life. Um, there's no thought given to that before uh, they're referred to law enforcement. So there's no care within the school system. Uh, they get harsher punishments for less serious behavior um, and are often punished for subjective offenses, offenses such as loitering or being disrespectful. And depending on what culture you come from, disrespect can look really different, right? So um, they also, uh, she also has this statement in the article that not shocked me, but I thought was really important to talk about. The US Department of Education reports that students with disabilities incur repeated disciplinary actions and are more than twice as likely to receive out of school suspension than students without disabilities. Students with disabilities represent 12% of the overall student population, yet they make up 25% of, of all students involved in school-related arrests. That's, to me personally, that's an insane number. Um, this is also uh, the same 
for LGBTQ youth. And I think it's getting worse recently with the with the rise in a lot of LGBTQ uh anti LGBTQ um rules or laws being um made in this country. Ooh, uh, why is it not going? I can't go to the next slide. Oh, I did it. Okay. Um, <laughs> and um, in con. In her conclusion, uh, Simone talked about how the illiteracy, um, uh, special education, and um, re reporting to law to the to law enforcement all goes back to uh, race as an issue. So this issue cannot be solved simply by um, well. First of all, she she clarifies. Or she insists that the Arlington community, um, the Arlington school system, is not willing to acknowledge that there is a uh, an issue of um, school to prison uh, within their community. And so first, she asks people to acknowledge that this is an issue, and then she f asks people to acknowledge that this is an issue because of race. Um, there are not there. There are a lot of um, issues that people within the leadership in Arlington schools are not willing to admit to they're not willing to talk about it and and they want to pretend like it do, it doesn't exist or it's not happening so that they can keep moving forward and she says we can't move forward until we acknowledge that the school system doesn't take care of its students with disabilities it doesn't take care of its black or brown students um, and I find myself agreeing with her after doing further research, as well as just from reading her article. Um, and also from my own personal uh, experience from going to um, a school that had predominantly black or brown students and seeing just how um, just how mistreated we were in comparison to our um, white classmates. Um, I put something here that isn't really about um, the, the school to prison pipeline, but I feel like it could make situations worse. So the, uh, the VA 2022 model policies recently uh, came out the document for it. I have linked it here. I can drop it in the comments or in the chat, but there, creating policies that would basically force teachers in Virginia to uh, out their students, kind of like with the don't say gay in Florida. Um, I feel like, as you saw earlier on in my slides, um, LGBTQ youth are also um, arrested at a higher rate and suspended at a higher rate. And I think if this, if this law gets written up, it's just gonna make things worse in Virginia. Um, and there's going to be way more children um, that act, quote unquote, act out and um, get in more trouble and get arrested. So I would like to ask you all to take a moment to look at that and uh, call your governor, your senators, you know, whoever makes the decisions, write letters to them and, uh, you know, stop this from happening in Virginia. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I'm done. Uh, stop share. Okay, thank you so much. And I guess that's me. So I have no fancy slideshows. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna talk with you for a little bit. Um, and starting with appreciation for this space to address a really pressing issue that a lot of people want to duck. And I want to talk about it. It's something that happens in the dark. Prisons are hidden. So if people don't know, if people don't look that it's not right there in your face when you go to the supermarket, that's intentional. And that's why these conversations need to happen. And that's why I appreciate people like Sarah and Maron and Bernice and Patricia, all of us who are willing to continue to engage in these conversations and challenge ourselves to each other and others outside of us um, 
to see something better and to envision something better. So I want to share with you a bit of how like everything shared today speaks to my life. And early on, after my incarceration, uh, even for the first few years, I didn't believe that the school to prison pipeline was a real thing, let alone the, the cradle to prison pipeline. Uh, I hadn't even heard of that at the time. Um, for me, it was what a lot of people say is that, oh, it's, it's, it's an excuse that people use to not have to take responsibility for what they've done. And I believe that. I said it myself. Uh, until I had engaged in enough healing and enough growth to be able to look honestly at my life, take accountability for what I had done, forgive myself enough to be able to see how external factors led into my internal, right? We um, talked about internalization. And Bernice talked about internalization and how, for me, in my life, when you grow up hearing that you're worthless and that you need to fight for your life because people in authority, especially police, are out to get you, that they will kill you if given the opportunity, and that because of the tone of your skin and the texture of your hair, that you need to protect yourself and that you need to work twice as hard as your white counterparts in order to get half as far. These are my early, early, early life lessons, five, six, seven years old, amplifying when I got to nine, 10, really, really getting exposed to the footage of the civil rights era of having dogs sicked on black people by police, brutal documentaries and television series that depict horrible, horrible, horrific violence against black bodies by white people. That is how we are taught growing up in this country. That is what we are supposed to protect ourselves against. And every time that there's a police killing, all of that history comes up. And all of a sudden, it's time to protect ourselves again. If for a split second, if for a split second you thought you were safe, forget it. You're not. You need to be on guard. You need to be vigilant every day, every moment, every second of your life. That is the reality that so many people live with every day in this country. And I know it's 2022, right? Racism doesn't, doesn't exist. We, we live in a post-racist society. Yet if that was true, then I would not have needed to hop on the phone three weeks ago to talk my eldest nephew off the ledge after an attempt that was made on his life by his neighbors who had spent the previous several months making monkey noises and throwing racial epithets at him because he had the audacity to be in a relationship with a white woman. This was three weeks ago in 2022. Not even into the fall yet. So when people say that race doesn't matter, that race is a social construct, yes, it is a social construct. But it's a social construct that people have bought into and that people have guided their lives by and that people directed their violence through. And that's something that still exists. And that is the foundation upon which so many of the systems that we live in, all of them in this country, that is the foundation upon which they have been built. Yes, we look at the prison system. And yes, it is torturous in so many, so many ways. Thankfully, I can stand here in the old segregation unit where I got extracted 11 years ago and speak on Wi-Fi a presentation about how messed up the prison system is. Right? This is a beautiful thing. Yet I am an exception within the exceptions within this institution. 
in this system in this state is an exception among exceptions around this country. So the statistics that have been shared about how horrible and how disproportionate the state sponsored violence is against black, BIPOC, indigenous people across this country. Look at the majority of the prisons. That's what people don't want to do. And if they do dare look, there is an unwillingness to even entertain the idea that there is a level of accountability on each and every one of us to do something about it. And so much of this starts in schools. While, for context, I live in Maine, right? Grew up in Maine. And this is a predominantly white state with predominantly white police and predominantly white schools. So while the rest of my classmates in elementary school were learning about how important police are and, and how they can be trusted and how they are the ones who need to be called, I was learning that I needed to protect myself against them. School was the breeding ground and for my first real life interaction and experience of racism and bigotry. My first fight was in third grade over another kid calling my brother the N-word. The following year, fourth grade, we moved and I was chased, me and my brother, through the cemetery by older high school kids throwing rocks at us. Made it to high school. <laughs> After several years of foster care, moved around all over the state, different town, different family, same experience. This time it was bottles thrown out of a moving car as I was told to go back to where I came from, not knowing that it was three towns over. This is the reality for so many people. And these are the stories that are not told and that when told are silenced because they don't line up with the dominant narrative around lazy black folk and how all they need to do is lift, lift themselves up by the bootstraps and they'll be fine. That always brings me back to Martin Luther King when he says that one of the cruelest jests is when you tell a man with no boots to pull himself up by his bootstraps. As you're driving down the road, whether you're headed to school or you're headed to work, take a look around. How many people are living in this country right now without boots? I know you see them. You can't live in a city without seeing them. They're all over the place. And so a large portion of how this systemic racism and this harm, this systemic harm, this systemic violence, this structural violence is perpetuated and internalized is because we don't get the language, right? We have the experience, we have the suffering, we have the, the hatefulness thrown at us. And, we, and that's what we live in, that's what we swim in throughout our lives. And yet we don't have a language. I didn't really develop the language of structural violence until I made it to grad school after I had been in prison for 12 years. 12 years of incarceration. Came in when I was 18. Made it through my associate's degree, made it through my bachelor's. Only because I'm in a facility where I have access to fight to scrounge up the funds to be able to attend graduate school was I able to learn the language to be able to articulate the suffering that I endured throughout my life? So if there are currently over 2 million people incarcerated around this country, how many people don't have that access? How many people are stuck in a place of the 60% who are stuck in functional illiteracy or dysfunctional illiteracy.
because some people can get by not being able to read, yet how many can't? So this is the reality. So much, so much suffering exists in this world. It starts at home. It starts, it started generations ago. And that's why it's important to understand how trauma works within us, between us, and, and over generations. Because that is what we're living through. That is what we're dealing with. And that is what we need to overcome if we are going to be able to move into a better future, which for me, for those who don't know, is an abolitionist future. <laughs> a place that does not have jails or prisons, that does not believe that human beings deserve to be caged in order to be taught. I believe in a future that is grounded in community. And this right here is the beginning. So thank you for being willing to step into this community and build this community with me. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Bernice. Thank you, Marone. Thank you, Sarah. The plot plan was to have, um, and I'm speaking now to the presenters mostly, we have till 20 after 25 after probably four, and we can take some questions from the plenary and then there'll be breakout groups with a, with a facilitator and one of the um, presenters to discuss further some of the things that, that you're grappling with or that you would like to know more inf information about. Um, so who wants, is, is it, are there any questions? Um, kind of raise the hand feature, although I only can see part of you on my screen. So any any comments that you want to make or questions you want to put to uh, our presenters at the moment? OK, I'm not seeing yet. So should we go into breakout rooms and then do some discussion and kind of sorting through some of the dynamics that you've been presented with? And if that is the case, okay. Trisha, I think we've got a question in the chat. I just, yes, noticed that. Uh, could anybody share some abolition focused organizations? Okay. Um, does anybody have that on tap, Leo? I have an incredible list um, yeah. generated. It, it's not very uh, local. It's, it's very much national. I have access to through the Freedom and Captivity Project. Mm -hmm. um, so I will see if I can bring that up and share it out in the chat. Yeah. That would be great. And then, uh, so that's Georgia. She's um, particularly interested in the coalition in DC. And I will do some sorting on that, Georgia, and see if I can find some things specifically uh, based there. And Leo might have some things when he sends you something or links something to the chat. I'll have to do this after this is done. Okay. So, uh, Lane, what are your thoughts about listening to the presentations? Okay, some of the these are some questions we could ask either in plenary or in the breakout room. Uh, what in, in, impacted you most significantly during the presentations? What additional information would be helpful? Which please let us know and we'll tend to that. How do we make sense of this ongoing experience for so many? And these are suggested conversation flows that might begin. Um, okay, so Georgia has added that list. All right, so would you prefer to do this in smaller groups in, in breakout rooms, which would be fine? 
Lane, what do you think? Yep, I've got breakout rooms if you're ready. Um, and we can just use the questions we've got in the chat. Yeah, that would be great. We use the questions we have in the chat. And these are not questions you have to ask. These are samples of what you might want to ask or frame a question around it. And uh, we will have, so I will, okay, it abolition resources. So I will um, turn it now over to the uh, person, Lane, who, Andrew, who has taken the challenge of the breakout rooms. <laughs> I'll go ahead and open those rooms now. And I just want to say, you know, I appreciate the academic perspective. And I also, um, I did feel deeply impacted by Leo. And I think that there's something to be said there about the personal, the personal stories and really uplifting voices of folks who have been impacted by these systems. And, um, you know, like Leo, I always love hearing you share. And I think that that's both because you're a great presenter, but also, you know, real life experience matters. And I think that um, I just want to express gratitude for sharing yours today. So thanks, y'all. So our group, we had a lot of, a lot of discussion, uh, one of them being, well, how can we get involved? Why is the abolition is the way to go, but also why is it so difficult? Um, we also touched on trauma-informed healing versus, or trauma-informed resolutions actions, right, Leo? I think I'm right, I don't know. And then- healing center as opposed to trauma. Center. Yes, there we go, that's where I was looking for. Um, and the differences between the two in how healing-centered actions are a lot more beneficial especially for those who were being impacted by um, systemically. I don't know. I think we all really appreciate the, I would, speaking for my group, I think we all really appreciate um, today's session. You know, we learned a lot and a lot of it stuck with us. And I hope that this takes, uh, takes everyone who's sitting, who's here now um, and encourages us to be, be, the, be a change in our communities, whether we educate others, whether we, share resources, whether we volunteer and we get involved, as long as we're doing something. So thank you. Great work. And uh, on that note, I'll actually uplift a question that was brought out um, in our group about how people can get involved in supporting good work that is happening in Virginia. Um, so I encouraged people to reach out to Harold Clark, the director of Virginia Department of Corrections, um, and he will be able to direct you to whoever your point person needs to be, um, whether it's education and programs, reentry. Um, he's your guy. All right, thank you. Anybody else, final comments, appreciation? Let's all unmute and clap our hands at the inspiration and the community that we've experienced here. If I had whistles, it would have been more effective. We didn't. So thank you for um, attending. There is going to be in November, first part of November, a mini conference that will follow up with women and incarceration it will be a much longer event, which you don't have to go to all of it, but there'll be three sessions with different frames around incarceration and women. Because women is the quick, fastest growing group of folks that are now being incarcerated. So it is a big, and the experience inside is another matter as well. So it's, it's horrible in it's slightly different way than, or in all ways, but then, than we've, we've talked about here. So thank you for attending. I appreciate your interest. And Leo, thank you for presenting. Anna, thank you. I'm looking at the list here. Thank you, Anna, for uh, facilitating and uh, Sarah for presenting, Marone for presenting, Bernice for presenting, Amanda for facilitating, who have I forgotten? I don't know. 
anyway, thank you all for being here and uh, go forth and be brilliant because you are. <laughs>